When the pandemic hit several years ago, governments forced their populations into lockdown. And I remember a few people、uh, spread this kind of sentiment. They actually suggested the lockdowns would have a positive effect on most people. Because after all, they assumed people were just so busy going around doing so much beforehand. And now that they were forced to stay in their homes, they would naturally slow down and reconnect with what mattered in their life. <laughs> But did that end up happening? Not for most of us. Being in lockdown didn't help people reconnect with nature or a slower pace of life. In fact, the lockdowns did much more harm than good. So, why were people who expressed this idea wrong? Well, they were operating under a false notion that most people embrace. They assumed that because people's external circumstances had changed, they'd automatically improve for the better. Oh, well, now I can't distract myself with endless activity. So that must mean I have no other choice but to slow down and reconnect with my true values. But even when they're locked in their homes, people are still people. Their lives didn't automatically get better because they couldn't fill up their day with outdoor activities. If you've ever spent time doom scrolling on Instagram or another social app, chances are you've seen、uh, this type of person many times. They're usually at some impressive location, like on a mountaintop or in their massively amazing home. And they look good, wearing flattering clothes. They have flawless skin and perfect bodies. And usually they're wearing something like a watch or jewelry that just screams wealth. These people call themselves influencers. And their whole goal is to try to convince you they have the secret to improving your life. They might just be offering tips or improvements, guidance like that. Most of them, though, are trying to sell you a book, their seminar, their course, or even supplements. People get taken in by these influencers all the time. And it's because, at a glance, they appear to have their life all together. And people watching online, you know, they think that's the life that I want to have. Maybe you have tried to listen to advice from these people, thinking that whatever they got can actually improve your life and make you finally happy. But does that ever really work out? No. And for the same reason, those lockdown optimists were wrong. Because all the advice and the products these social media influencers are pushing are just external changes to your circumstances. They might work for a little while. Or they might change a few parts of your life, but they can't change what's really going on on the inside. This is because most people believe a lie that changes to our external circumstances, be they a lockdown, a diet, new clothes, a change in careers, will lead to lasting improvements that will eventually give you the life you want and make you happy. But they don't. Because these external changes can't touch the real problem that is inside of us. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't diet or exercise or do anything that might bring about a positive change to your life. But you are fooling yourself if you think that losing 10 pounds is going to finally make you happy. Now, yes, follow doctor's advice, implement changes to what you want to eat, become more active, all that's great. But there's a reason. Most people don't stick with fad diets or exercise. Many people who have success on a diet revert back to their old patterns, and they usually gain more weight than they had before. So, what's going on? Well, like I said, dieting and exercise is fine, and so are other changes to your life. But all these are external changes to your circumstances. It looks like they're fixing something in your life. But in the end, you are still the same person you were before you made those changes. That's because external changes cannot touch the problem lurking deep inside of you. Christians who believe the Bible know the real problem we all face on the inside is sin. Because our ancestors Adam and Eve sinned, every human being is born a sinner. We are born enemies of our Creator. We don't know Him, nor do we care about what He says. And we spend most of our lives doing the very things he told us not to do. Because we are alienated from God, we can never be happy. 
No amount of changes to our appearance, increases in money, or improvements in our external circumstances can replace what we really need, a relationship with our Heavenly Father. The good news is Jesus Christ died on the cross to take away our sin. Faith in Jesus results in the forgiveness of our sins. And with our sins removed, we can know God. True happiness comes from Him. You could be fat, skinny, short, tall, rich, poor, young, old, and still experience true satisfaction in life because you have Jesus. This is the gospel. This is what the Bible teaches us. But many Christians actually still live under this idea that external changes to their circumstances will improve their life or make them good Christians. They may rightly understand that they're saved by grace through faith, which is what the Bible says. But once they are saved, they think that God approves of them based on outer things like what they do. Why is that? Why are humans so hardwired to believe that external controls are the key to a happy life? Well, there is a reason for that, and the Bible reveals it to us. I am Adam Castellino, and this is the Gospel Talker Podcast. So does the Bible actually say anything about the stuff that I've been talking about? You might not realize it, but it does. In fact, this reality affects every human being. And if you are a Christian, you need to understand this in order to live the life God intends for you to live. Paul actually talks about this very thing in Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the day set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, an heir through God. Okay, so what is Paul talking about here? You may be familiar with some of this. He's talking about Jesus and, and the Holy Spirit. But he's using some interesting language, some metaphorical language that we should uh, spend time decoding. He says, when we were children, we were all slaves to the elementary principles of the world. Okay, what is that? Paul uses a similar term in the book of Colossians when he's talking about the same issue. But what are the elementary principles of the world? That sounds like something out of Greek mythology, right? The elementary principles of the world. Like, what? that's in the Bible? What does that mean? Is he talking about spirits of nature? Is he saying that we were enslaved to Satan and his demons? Well, some Bible teachers interpret that phrase in that way, but there's actually much more to it. These principles have certainly been used by Satan to deceive and manipulate humanity, but they're actually something different. Now, when Paul says we are children, of course, he's not talking about our age, and he's not talking about uh, us being spiritual children in Christ, which is another metaphor. He is instead referring to our lives before we receive Jesus Christ as our Savior. Okay, it's a metaphor. And if you think about it, it makes sense. You see, children don't possess the inheritance of their parents or grandparents, right? And on top of that, children are in charge. We don't give kids bank accounts. They can't drive cars. They can't vote. They don't work at a job. They don't pay taxes because they're children. They cannot make important decisions, Instead, they are subject to the will and demands of those larger and older than them, those who have power over them. So from a certain point of view, children are like slaves. They are not free. They can't do what they want. They're not in control of their lives. And Paul says that when we receive Christ, we are no longer slaves. We are therefore set free from What was our master's, so to speak, these elementary principles? But then he says something really important. 
He goes on in the same chapter to rebuke his audience, the churches in Galatia, in verses 8 through 11. He writes, Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. But now that you have come to know God, or rather, to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world, whose slaves you want to be once more? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I'm afraid I may have labored over you in vain. So Paul was telling this group of churches that when they came to Christ, they were set free from these principles. But now, they're turning back again to things that are not truly God. He calls these principles weak and worthless. So what are these principles? Well, we get the first clue from the word elementary. Okay, that suggests principles uh, or laws derived from the elements, meaning the stuff of the natural world. Now, we uh, have a periodic table of the elements, which lists the substances that the natural world is made of. But in ancient times, they knew about elements too, just not as many as we know now. So when they say elements, they're talking about the stuff of the material, natural world. And that's what Paul is referring to. These are principles, okay, realities that we can't get away from, what we sometimes call laws, that are connected to our earthly life, our earthly existence, apart from the life that God can give us spiritually. So let's delve into this a little bit more. If you've ever studied the book of Galatians before, you know that Paul wrote this book to rebuke a group of churches in a region called Galatia, in modern-day Turkey, for embracing the law of Moses. As we would call it, they were converting to Judaism. He explains that in Christ, nobody, Jew or Gentile, is obligated to follow the law of Moses to be saved. He says you don't have to follow all of these laws and rules in order to receive forgiveness from God, approval from God, or to be right with God. Now, before these Galatians believed in Christ, they weren't Jews at all. They were Gentiles. They had never been under the law in the first place. But we just read in that passage that Paul says that they have turned back again to something they were once enslaved under by converting to Judaism. Now, isn't that interesting? They were never Jews in the first place. Paul is saying these Gentiles, who were used to be pagans before Jesus, were in the same situation as Jews who lived under the law of Moses. That's pretty interesting, if you think about it. Both Jews and Gentiles, apart from Jesus Christ, were enslaved, Paul says, to these things called elementary principles. So what are these principles? And what does this have to do with what I started talking about at the beginning of this episode? Well, these elementary principles I would call the law of works, or what the Bible often calls the curse. So let's break it down. In my last episode, I spent time talking about how humanity received a curse after they disobeyed God in the Garden of Eden. This curse was actually God's judgment against Adam and Eve for sinning. Because they were parents of the rest of humanity, this judgment was passed on to all of us. We aren't sinners because we sin. In reality, we sin because we're sinners, right? Dogs don't bark to become dogs. They bark because they're dogs. But we are sinners because this sin was passed on to us through Adam. And with that sin, the curse Now, you might not like the idea that you were born a sinner because of something done ages ago by a person you never even met. Paul explains that when Adam sinned, all humanity sinned with him. You can read about this in Romans 5, verses 12 through 21. But how is this possible? Well, because every human being technically was inside Adam when he sinned. What I mean is this. All humans were born from Adam and his wife. We descended from them. So, we inherited their traits. So listen, if your grandma has blue eyes and curly hair, there's a chance you're going to have those too. If your great-grandpa was an alcoholic, there's a risk you'll be one as well. Now, not all traits are passed down from father to son, but the potential is still there, locked inside your DNA. In fact, you might not have a trait from your parents, but that trait might get passed on to your kids, because it's all there inside human 
genealogy. But sin is one of those traits, so to speak, that everyone gets. All right? You don't have to like it, but you can't ignore it. And the people who do ignore it, who for some reason claim they are not sinners by nature, well, they need a reminder of what is right and wrong. So they can realize that, yep, they've done a lot of wrong things in their life, which proves that they are sinners. And God's law does a very good job of doing that. So we are all cursed thanks to Adam. But what is this curse? And what does it have to do with the elementary principles of this world? Well, like I said, these principles are, in fact, part of the curse. Let's go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. You probably know the story. Adam and Eve disobeyed God and ate from the tree he told them not to eat from. Then God spoke over them a series of judgments, which he called curses. Collectively, we call them the curse, but it's actually a bunch of curses. This is what he said to the woman. Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to Adam, God said this. In verses 17 through 19. Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground. For out of it you are taken. From dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Okay, so let's focus on what God said to Adam. He highlights Adam's role in relationship with the earth, a.k.a. the elements. Adam was given authority over the entire planet. And God told him to be fruitful and multiply, filling the earth and ruling over the animal kingdom. That was Adam's job, so to speak. And Eve's as well. This was God's edict to the human race. And notice, however, God's command had nothing to do with working for their basic needs. Adam and Eve lived in a garden that produced all the food they needed. We can assume the rest of the world would have been like that or that the garden would have continued to grow and expand as humanity grew and filled the earth. Point is, their basic needs were already met by God. The work that God had told them to do wasn't about trying to meet their needs, but to fill the earth, to have babies, to watch over the creation. In other words, enjoy this beautiful planet that God had made for them. But after they sinned, Adam had a big problem. God told him the land would no longer just naturally produce food for him. Instead, it's going to produce thorns and thistles. He can't eat those. So Adam now has to toil to get what he needs. God said by the sweat of his face, he'll eat bread. Something that was once provided for him, he now has to labor and agonize to get. The same is true for Eve. Part of her role was to have children. Being fruitful and multiplying, after all, meant having babies. But now even that is going to be a struggle with intense pain. We call it labor for a reason, because it is intensely painful to deliver children. Normally, when Christians talk about this curse, they focus on the very last part, from dust to dust, or death. We zero in on that fact because Adam and Eve sinned, they were cursed with death. And that's true, that's a big part of the curse. But that's only a part of it. Most of what God says here is that because humanity sinned, they now have to struggle to do what they're supposed to do. They now have to struggle to make ends meet. Adam and his descendants are at the mercy of a world that does not want to help them. By the sweat of our brows, we have to earn our keep. And even that can only provide just a bite of bread. Now this reality goes beyond just food. In order for us to survive on this planet, we have to toil. Job 7.1 even says that man's life on earth is warfare. We have to battle it out just to get by each day. The overarching principle that we all live under is that if you want something out of life, you have to bust your back to get it. Now, this idea is so ingrained in human society that we even apply it to God. If we want favor with God, we have to work for it. God gave the Israelites a set of books to guide them through life. 
They called it the Torah or the Law of Moses. But because they too were under this curse, those guidelines, that instruction, became just more work for them to do. Not only do they have to toil and strive to eat, they have to toil and strive to please God. It's not enough to simply ask God for help. They had to follow strict rules, offer up the right sacrifices, observe days and seasons, go to a specific place and follow whatever the priests told them to do. This curse or law of works so pervades human existence that we think we have to follow strict rules and rituals to please God. And that's become what we call religion. So it's important to ask at this point if this was God's intention. God gave Israel the law, right? So wasn't his goal to make them follow it so they could have his blessing? Well, we know from the scriptures that no one ever perfectly obeyed the law. Every honest, sincere Israelite of faith fell short in some way. And the law has within it this serious warning. Okay, Paul talks about this in Galatians chapter 3, verse 10. He writes, For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law, and to do them. So the law right there once again talks about this curse. Now this is the same curse we've been talking about, because the law was written to show Israel their shortcomings. So they would understand that they too are under this curse of sin. They don't get out of it just because they're Jews. Now you might be asking at this point, well, what about Gentiles? They don't have the law. Why should they care? Well, notice what the law says. Cursed is everyone who does not abide by the law. So that's you or me too. So Jews under the law couldn't fully obey it and were faced with the realities that they are cursed like Adam and Eve. But Gentiles don't even have the law. Paul said they were, we were under uh, these enslaved things that weren't even gods. At least the Jews knew the true God. But the rest of us, we were struggling to live on this earth without the light of God's word. And we are enslaved to this curse, this principle, where we have to work hard, labor hard, just to get what we need. And even in the best of circumstances, all that we could hope for was a bite of bread, and in the end we returned to dust. You see, every human being was born with an understanding of right and wrong. And Paul tells us that it was innate in human beings, this reality of who God was. In Romans 1, 19-23, he says, For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. So he says right there, what is known about God is plain to them. Well, what, is no, what do we know about God? He is good. And he wants us to do good and shun evil. So all this is to say, whether you're Jew or Gentile, we have this idea of right and wrong. Even when we try to do the right thing, for whatever reason, we still fail. This is part of this curse. We have to struggle and strive to get what we need, but in the end we still die. That's not just about food. We could strive to do the right thing, to try to please God and, and live out the right versus the wrong. But we still fail because this curse was brought about by sin. And because we're sinners, we cannot fully do what is right. So simply put, the elementary principles of this world are not demons or false gods. These principles are the reality that we are under a curse, forced to toil and labor because the natural world our, and our natural life is full of uh, opposition. And this reality extends to every area of our life, making it a collection of principles that affect everything we do. Both Jews and Gentiles are under this curse. The Jews failed to keep God's law and would face punishment for that. And the Gentiles were left in the dark, toiling against forces they did not understand, doomed to die. It's not a great place to be in, huh? So you can call it whatever you like. I think the law of works is one term. We could call it the curse. We could talk, call it um, principles, like Paul says. But it affects every human being because of sin. We have to struggle and toil to get what we want and need. So how does this relate to what we were talking about at the start of the episode? 
Well, because fallen human beings have to labor to get their basic necessities, this has affected our view of life. We have to struggle to survive, so we place too much emphasis on our external circumstances. It's so hard to just make ends meet that we treasure pleasant circumstances to the point where we assume that if we simply change our external circumstances through our efforts, we can be happy. Do you see how that is connected with this law of works? And do you see how Paul associates it with this idea of gods because we labor and strive for the earth to help us, almost as if these are forces that we worship? We have to labor and strive just to lose weight, just to get a better job, just to look good, just to have what we want. And it's almost a form of religion, and it's a form of slavery. And this has developed into a way of thinking where we wrongly assume that if we work hard enough, we can get whatever we want. And getting what we want will finally, finally make us happy. But that hasn't worked for a single human being since the start of history. That's because the real thing that will make us happy is kept from us because of our sin. As I said at the start, true happiness, or you can say joy, contentment, satisfaction, comes through knowing God, a personal relationship with our Creator. We could only have that when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. He ensured that the thing separating us from God, our sin, was removed. Being forgiven means we can know God by faith and truly be satisfied by fellowship with Him. Nothing else in this world is going to beat that, not by a long shot. But as I said, even Christians can fall back under this curse that we have to labor and strive for God's approval. We saw the Galatians were doing just that, and Paul had to rebuke them. But even Christians today can fall into this trap. We may not convert to Judaism or something like that, But the temptation still exists to default to this lifestyle of works and labor, especially works and labor to please God, because we're surrounded by people who think and live this way. So how can we be saved from this curse or law of works? And why should you believe me that we are free from this curse, the toiling and striving to survive and please God? Well, Paul explains that in Galatians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised Spirit through faith. You see what it says there? Christ redeemed us from the curse. Jesus became a curse for us. And because of that, we are no longer cursed, but we can look forward to having the blessing of Abraham through faith. Instead of being cursed, we're blessed. Most Bible-believing Christians know they're saved by grace. But some of them might fall back into this mindset of works-based. Well, God saved me, so now I have to toil and strive to prove myself to Him or to grow in my faith. You might even think that if you're not working hard enough, you'll stumble into sin and lose your salvation. But the Bible says we are no longer under that yoke of bondage. We are no longer under the curse God pronounced over Adam and Eve. We now have the blessing of Abraham. God blessed Abraham in many ways. But he did so by grace, unmerited favor. God blessed Abraham not because of anything he did, but because God was showing him favor Abraham did not deserve. That is the same blessing we have received. Because of Jesus' finished work on the cross, we have blessings we do not deserve. That doesn't stop just at salvation. We continue in this favor, this grace, because we are Abraham's children. But what about the curse? It is nullified. We no longer have to toil and strive to just get a bite of bread. And we don't have to fear death because God promised we will live forever. Let's look at the curse God pronounced over Adam and see how it no longer applies to us. First off, God condemned Adam because of his sin. Remember, God said in verse 17 of Genesis 3, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. 
So this whole curse is because of sin. But we are no longer condemned for our sins because of Jesus. Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. God is no longer condemning or punishing you for your sin because Jesus took our punishment on the cross. So what does God say next? In the curse, God says this to Adam. In this verses 17 and 19. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the fields. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. Okay, so this one might surprise you, because on the face of it, life is still difficult, and even Christians have to work and toil. So is this still applicable to us? Let's focus on the scope of this statement. God is saying that fallen mankind must toil and strive to get what they need. And we establish this includes doing good works to earn favor with God. So is that the case anymore? No. We are not justified before God through what we do. We do not work to earn God's favor. Paul says this in Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. Yet we know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Jesus Christ in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law because by the works of the law no one will be justified. And Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 repeats this by saying, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing, it is a gift of God, not as a result of works. So this is true for everyone who believes in Jesus Christ. We do not work to keep God's approval. Whether you have been saved for a day, or been saved for 20 years, God accepts you because of his grace. You have his unmerited favor, his love, his help, and his goodness because of what Jesus did, not what you did or do. But what about all this sweat of your brow stuff? Aren't humans supposed to work hard to earn their keep, Christian or non-Christian? Well, at this point you might be saying to me, Hey Adam, I was raised to appreciate the value of a hard day's work. Are you telling me my pappy was wrong? Well, let's think about it. Work... Hard work is not a curse. God called Adam and Eve to work long before there was sin. And it's good for people, especially men, to put in a hard day's work, whatever that might mean for you in your job. But if you think that your hard work is providing bread for you and your family, you are dreaming. If it was not for the grace of God, we'd all be dead. The fact that you have a good-paying job and are able to work and support yourself or your family is because God is allowing it. That's true even for unbelievers, whether they realize it or not. Working is not the curse. The curse is that you have to toil and struggle and strive and agonize in your own flesh just to get a tiny bit of what you want or need. Bible tells us that those in Christ have entered a Sabbath's rest. Hebrews chapter 4 verses 9 and 10 say, So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Okay, so what, what does he mean when he says that those who enter God's rest also rested from his works? Is the writer of Hebrews saying we Christians don't need to work? Well, of course not. He's saying we are no longer toiling under the curse we've been talking about. We are no longer under those elementary principles that require our slavish obedience. We don't have to work to earn God's approval, nor do we have to struggle to just eke out a living. The reality is God promised to provide for us according to the unfathomable riches that are found in His Son. Philippians 4.19 says, And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Did you hear that? Every need of yours will be supplied by God. How? According to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. The same Jesus who took our curse on himself on the cross. The same Jesus who died to take away our sins. He didn't say God will supply your needs as long as you're breaking your back trying to make ends meet. He says he'll meet your needs according to the riches and glory in Jesus. Now that doesn't mean we don't work. Paul says in Ephesians we are created in Christ Jesus for good works. 
Work is a part of our lives we are, while we are on this side of eternity. But God has promised to always provide for us. We are not dependent on our fleshly strength or endurance to get us through the day. We are dependent on Him who said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That means work for a Christian is not painful toil or labor. It should be something we do from a place of rest. Rest from the fear of not having enough. Rest from the fear of circumstances out of your control. Rest that comes from the knowledge that the creator of the universe is taking care of us. And rest from the fear of death. The final thing God told Adam was he was going to die. In Genesis 3.19, he ends by saying, Till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Because of Adam's sin, he was cursed with death. Adam died the moment he sinned, right, spiritually speaking. But his physical body, God explained, would one day catch up to his spiritual death. So this is the worst part of the curse, the part Paul calls the last enemy. So you might be thinking, well, we're all going to die, right? So are Christians really free from the curse? Well, are we all going to die? Not according to Scripture. And even those who die in Christ will not stay dead. Jesus said this in John chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? So do we believe this? Jesus said those who believe in him shall never die. He wasn't lying. When we receive Christ by faith, our spirits come to life, never to die again. And though these outer bodies will grow weak and perish, we will promise new bodies that will never die. 2 Corinthians 5.1 says, For we know that if the tent that is our earthly body is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And we are not destined to float around the clouds playing a harp. That's not the future for those who believe in Christ. All those who receive Jesus will live in real, physical, deathless bodies on a new earth in New Jerusalem. Revelation 21 promises this. And they saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with men. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be them as their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. Every person who believes in Jesus Christ, I tell you, this is your new home. Where you live now is only temporary. It is not your forever home, no matter what your realtor told you. Your forever home is a glorious city that Jesus is preparing for you right now. You will live in this city, which is made of literal gold, and a new earth that will never pass away. And you'll be in a body that will not grow old, weak, tired, and will never die. All because Jesus took the curse from you. The promise of the new heaven and the new earth will one day be fulfilled. But what about today? How are Christians supposed to understand who they are right now? How can we be free from thinking we are still under the curse or law of works? How do we live in the knowledge that we are no longer enslaved to these elementary principles? Well, it first requires us to know the truth. We are no longer slaves, neither to sin nor to the curse of works. We need to remind ourselves of this truth each day. It's easy for a person to default to a works mindset because we are still living in this society full of fallen sinners. But Paul tells us this in Galatians 5.1, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Stand firm in your liberty. Do not let anyone bring you back under a yoke of slavery. You're not toiling to receive God's favor. You have it through Jesus. You don't have to toil and strive just to make ends meet. You can work from a place of rest, a place of confidence that God will supply all your needs. 
You can do good works as a Christian, not out of obligation, but joy, knowing that it is an honor to serve God and bless others. Remember what the Bible says, the righteous shall live by faith. Think about the significance of that truth. We live, we survive, we make it through the day because of faith. Not works, not toiling, not changes to our earthly circumstances, but by faith. And faith is a dependence on God's grace, relying on Jesus Christ, looking to Him. Faith is a relationship with Jesus based on His precious Word. Paul puts it this way in Galatians, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Chapter 5, verse 16. To walk by faith is to walk by the Spirit's leading. Listen to what He has to say to you. Heed the voice of the Lord in His Word and His still small voice in your heart. We are free from the curse of works. We are no longer have to do things to survive. All our needs are met in the person of Jesus. We are now walking in a new life, a life of rest where we get to enjoy fellowship with our Heavenly Father. He gives us every good and precious gift, and the work that we do in this life is made possible by what He provides for us. Now, we all forget this from time to time. We all stumble back into sin or back into a works mindset. But when you do, just repent, thank God for His precious grace, remind yourself of these truths from His Word. Faith is simply looking to Jesus for everything. Faith is resting in his arms, enjoying his company. Everything else will flow from that. The Gospel Talker podcast is written and produced by Adam Casolino. Visit us online at gospeltalker.substack.com.